Hello and welcome to our November New Moon Monologues and our last New Moon Monologues of the year. My name is Erin Holland. And my name is Grace O'Keefe. And tonight we welcome the last supermoon of 2020, which happens to be in Scorpio. Um, and as we approach the winter solstice, it's the perfect time to explore what happens when the sun goes down. And that is why tonight our theme is After Dark. Tonight's work features both monologues and poetry from a range of artists from all over the world. We cannot wait to share this digital collaboration on an international <laughs> scale with all of you. We hope you enjoy. Shit. Hang on. Hang on. <clears throat> Thank you for calling Web Poetry at Skype for Sorcerer. My name is Walperga here to meet your magical needs. Can I ask your name, caller? Simon, lovely. Okay, Simon, just pop your Web Witchery pin into the box at the top of your screen. Next to the pentagram? Lovely. And while we're waiting for that to process, I'll just quickly tell you about our special offer to celebrate this week's full moon. If you recommend two friends for our tarot or crystal readings, you'll get 50% off any of our healing and harm charms. Please note that due to the COVID-19 emergency, healing charms are restricted to two per customer and love potions are unavailable due to the social distancing rules. Would you like me to send you the link, Simon? You sure? Okay. Please choose from the following magical options. Spells, hexes, fortune telling, charms, potions, Curses, summoning demons, raising the dead. A curse, lovely. We've got the three minor mishaps curse, the worst we can, the fully comprehensive job, car, home, dog and or cat. There's the long and lingering illness curse. And of course, the COVID-19 is very popular at the moment. You want the COVID-19, lovely. Would that be Unseen Carrier? Horse and Haggard, Near Death, Boris Johnson style, Actual Near Death, or Actual Death? Actual Near Death. Not the Boris Johnson one. You wanted to actually have it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Him being... Who is it for, pet? Will. And uh, is Will your partner? Ex-partner. <laughs> Lovely. Will... Mason. M-A-S-O-N. He's cheated on you. Again? <laughs> oh dear. He's not even trying to social distance, is he? That'll be 39.99. Plus 380. Visa debit? Lovely. Just pop your card number into the box on the left of your screen. And do you have anything that belongs to him? Something personal like a hat, a glove, a comb with some of his hairs in it? <laughs> You've got a condom you used. He used. <laughs> Lovely. Mm. If you're absolutely sure it's his. This is quite powerful magic. You see, Simon, once a curse is dispatched, it can't be cancelled or transferred. Four terms and conditions are available on our website. Skype is also accepts no liability for loss, damage, arrest, death or damnation due to inaccurate incantations or erroneous objects. His toothbrush, that might be better. Because if you're not sure about the condom, you're 85. 75. 70% sure. <laughs> Get the toothbrush, Simon. <laughs> okay, lovely. What's that? Is that a toothbrush? Are you sure? It's like a little wire. Looks like mascara for a mouse. 
Oh, <laughs> for brushing in between your teeth. <laughs> I see. Will's very fastidious about his teeth, anyway. So, what I need you to do, Simon, is hold your toothbrush up to your screen. That's lovely. Now, press it in your hands really tight and picture one for me. He's tall with... Just picture him for me, Simon, okay? If you see him, I see him, okay? Amia, Amia, Amia. Okay then, Simon. That's a COVID-19 near-death care's order for Will. If I can grab an address for him for delivery. 27A Wellington Road. Lovely. And he'll definitely be in, will he? He's self-isolating. Only he isn't two times sneak. No, we can't really send it to a neighbor's house. That's not a good idea, it being a near-death COVID virus care, Simon. Well, I'll get that off to him right away. Did you want to add a message? I... I... Hope you choke. Well, <laughs> yes. That is a little spiteful, isn't it? I hope this hurt you like you hurt me. No? Okay, <laughs> no message. Right, well, that's all ordered for you, Simon. Is there anything else that I can help you with? Can I see where there's any pasta? <clears throat> Sorry, Simon, I'm good. But not that good. Well, you've earned five loyalty points, which will be accredited to your web witchery account. My name is Wild Perga. Skype a sorcerer may contact you to evaluate your magical purchasing experience. And I hope you'll be happy with my sorcery. <laughs> Lovely. Bye for now then. Bye. You poor, sad, stupid sod. <clears throat> Jason? It's Haley. You awake? Got a job for you. You sick? Tough. Sick people don't get paid, Jason. Well, take some paracetamol and get up. Okay. 27A Wellington Road. Near death curse. Near death, Jason. Let's not try to kill this one, shall we? Call me when you're done. Lovely.
woman that found she didn't have a face. Each morning she wakes up bare and paints two black circles so she can see. She retraces yesterday's strokes following previous indentations that have been forged into her skin after years of perfecting her craft. She renews forgotten structures with delicate shards of lead and once again becomes an all too familiar stencil. But her charcoal anatomy is worn and behind the harsh black contours you can see cheekbones from years ago faded and smudged creating a new darker canvas she draws on a smile her hands are older now, creating a shaky outline that clashes with a once rounded pair of lips. Her mind is old too, and the only art she can now muster consists of chaotic scrawls and basic strands, which she so cleverly fashions into her daily expression. Soon, it will be the end. No. She will choose to strip the canvas bare before the dust begins to settle. She will erase her art like she did every day before. But this time, she will stay. Because she knows that deep down, the best possible art form is when the artist is no longer an artist at all. They're just human. And, and totally, totally bare. bare. I go to bed each night, waiting to be devoured. No safety. No comfort, no rest. It all started with a bite. Well, three bites, actually. One, two, three, in a row up my leg. Apparently I'm delicious. But a bite's just a bite, right? I mean, lots of things bite. Mosquitoes bite. Spiders bite, gnats bite, lots of things bite, lots of bugs bite, right? But then I saw it. Shit. Shit. Shit! I've been invaded. Shit! Shit. I think I'm gonna be sick. Ugh. Hmm. Pro tip! If you ever, God forbid, get bed bugs, when you inevitably Google, is this a bed bug? Do not click Reddit. Whatever you do, do not go to the Bedbugs subreddit. And if you are a stubborn little shit who just has to see if the bug you found under your sheet looks exactly like BB Panic 78's bug that was confirmed to be a bedbug last week. And yes, it does look exactly like BB Panic 78's bug. Then I beg of you, do not scroll through the top posts. Do not. I promise you, you will regret it. Holy crap. Jesus.
Texas. My God. I'm a prisoner in my own home. There's no escape. I'm never alone anymore. It's always me and them. Them and me. Haunting me. Taunting me. Tearing up my life. Destroying my body, my clothes, my blankets, my bed. <laughs> Don't come between a girl and her bed. The bites are small. They barely itch. They fade quickly. Nothing has changed. But my life has changed. I can't go back. It's not just my home that's been invaded. It's my life. Things will never be the same. Not in here. Not anywhere. What if they follow me? What if I bring them wherever I go? What if I spread them wherever I go? What if they never go away? Bed bugs can typically live for a year without feeding. Cool. <laughs> Bed bugs feed by piercing the skin with an elongated beak through which they withdraw blood. Oh my god. I'm a human juice box. I have a transmittable disease. It's literally like herpes. My house has herpes. People used to not even care about bed bugs. Like, they've been here since Aristotle. The Romans used to make tea out of them. Like, humanity's history is riddled with bed bugs. Apparently, they nearly eradicated them in the 1950s with DDT, but then they banned it in the 1970s for its, you know, incredibly devastating environmental effects. Apparently, DDT also decreases semen quality, prevents menstruation, and can cause spontaneous abortions. Hmm. And so, bedbugs have been back on the rise ever since. Apparently, nearly 40% of homes have had bedbugs. Shit! It's even more common than herpes, and a lot of people have herpes. I'm not infected by bed bugs. The entire world is infected by bed bugs. We need to strike back. Kill those little suckers. Buy uh, some spray and a vacuum. Put everything I own in the dryer um, and some pesticidic powder uh -huh, and some cheap traps. Ooh, and maybe look up how to make DDT. <sighs> Cheap birth control aside, it's also a carcinogen, and I don't want cancer. Uh, how are no other treatments as effective? Come on, science! Get it together! It's 2020! How are we still dealing with bugs in our beds? That's some medieval shit right there. Anyways, uh, I should probably call the exterminator. Shit! <sighs> Look at you, you little swollen motherfucker! <laughs> you thought I wouldn't find you, did you? <sighs> oh, I know your little game. First, you wait for me to go to sleep, and then you suck the fuck out of me! Ho ho ho! Well, tonight is not your night, pal, because I'm about to crush the fuck out of you! <laughs> yeah, that's right, two can play at that game. That's what you get for sucking my blood and giving me an itchy bite. Oh, kind of itchy. Mm. Actually, they're starting to fade now. I guess it's not exactly tit for tat, is it? I mean, all you're trying to do is survive. It is a basic instinct, isn't it? Our core purpose as a living being, it... It's not your fault that all you eat is blood. I mean, a girl's gotta eat. It's kind of sexy. Like a vampire. Uh, well, uh, maybe not sexy. But like, 
You're harmless, right? <laughs> it's not like you'll kill me, right? You've been around for thousands of years without doing people any harm. You're like man's original best friend. Hey, stop scurrying. That's fucking creepy. You're a creepy little fuck, aren't you? But, I mean, creepy's kind of cool. Like, I like the Halloween vibe. You're like a pet. A creepy, blood-sucking pet. <laughs> All right. I'll let you go tonight as long as you promise not to crawl in my ear. But I might call the exterminator tomorrow, and if I do, then it's business time for you, buddy. All right. Night, night, Penelope. Delilah Gray was a very strange girl, a very strange girl indeed. Whilst most little girls like to play with dolls, Delilah Gray liked to read. But not gentle books about princesses and fairies. Delilah Gray's books were far more scary. Queens who screamed, off with their head, knights who fought until they were dead, beasts that ripped at innocent skin, Children's corpses in a madman's bin, viscera and blood, guts and gore. Delilah Gray wanted more and more. Children in school avoided Miss Gray. Their parents said, you must stay away. Little Delilah is an unusual child. She might look meek, she might look mild, but behind those blue eyes, behind that dark hair, behind that pale skin, a monster hides there. Born on a stormy Halloween night of darkness, little Delilah is Queen Fright. Good children listened to their mum and dad. They all believed Delilah was bad. So little Delilah went on her way. When you had books, who needed to play? All around her chatter would swirl. Is Delilah an ordinary girl? She seems to live alone in a tall, dark house. Her only companion, the occasional mouse. Her parents, the pair, have never been seen, except once in a window. A face so mean, a mouth so grim, with eyes so cruel, watching as Delilah walked to school. And Delilah herself had an aura so dark. A pale little face with eyes so stark animals saw her and turned away. Even wild wolves would not stay. She's a beast, a banshee, a witch, a fay. One day Delilah will take you away and locked in her house. She will hurt you at her leisure. And when you beg for death, she will whisper, Children steered clear of little Miss Grey. When they saw her coming, they dived out the way. Delilah Grey cared not one jot. For all she was bothered, the children could rot. But the boys at her school laughed at such tales. Monsters, they cried, are decidedly male. Little girls, they said, can't be naughty, only prim and proper, only haughty. Let's find out the truth for all and for once, what's going on inside that bonce. So, one icy night, four little boys followed little Delilah home. Pretending to be strong and brave, a monster they decided would make a good slave. Sneaking behind, so quiet, so slow. Those poor little boys, they weren't to know. Delilah led them down a deep, dark road. Delilah stopped walking, the boy's footsteps slowed. Delilah turned, a smile on her face. Hello and welcome to my special place. The boys just stared in horror, in fear. Delilah's face had turned ever so queer. Her eyes were huge and blacker than night. Her mouth was wide and ready to bite, with teeth so sharp and a tongue forked in two. Delilah smiled. Let's start with you. 
The boys scattered, running fast as they could. Delilah gave chase, herding them to the wood. Delilah started with Thomas Beach, ribbing his throat. She sucked like a leech. Delilah turned to Joshua Brine. Reaching towards him, she yanked out his spine. Delilah gave chase to Elliot Peggs. He ran very fast, but she cut off his legs. Finally, she caught the last little boy. She scratched and bit him like a dog with a toy. Kill me, please, cried Simon Measure. Delilah whispered, It will be my pleasure. Delilah Gray was a very strange girl. A very strange girl. Indeed. Boyfriend of three years lies stone asleep in our bed. Still and heavy as a boulder. I mean, honestly, it could be grown moss at this point. It's 3.26 a.m. and fucking cold and I've got a dishcloth of duvet to work with. I mean, I could pull and pull and it would barely budge. I give up. Get up. Tiptoe across the icy floorboards. I pick up my pillow he's pushed on the floor and go to sleep on the sofa. Again. Maybe some part of him is conscious, because as, as I leave, he seems to sink his weight into the mattress more, spread in a little further. Continental drift. I go to make a Horlicks, but he's used the rest of the milk. Well, there's about half a centimetre of milk left. And it's like, don't put what's basically an empty bottle of milk back in the fridge, so I have to wash it out and put it in the recycling and buy a new milk. I make one with just hot water and... Honestly, it's not bad, but the whole ordeal is not giving me the relaxing Horlicks feeling I was wanting. I need something mind-numbing to send me back to sleep. Antiques Roadshow. Perfect. The TV has an evil green glow about it at 3am. Like Fiona Bruce might start crawling out of it like that girl from the ring. I briefly think about turning the volume up full whack to wake him up. But it's hopeless, I know. The whole bed could go up in flames and he'd still be dead to the world. And no, that's not giving me ideas. But it's a warm thought in a cold living room. Just to entertain it. I can still hear him snoring through the walls, like a pig with asthma. Sometimes he wakes up before I do. He knows I'm sleeping on the sofa. The first few times it was dead apologetic. He said he'd try not to hog the blankets, take up too much space, snore too loud. He would try. Now he just sighs, all heavy, and puts all the weight on me. Fifteen tog of blame and shame. Oh, can't change what I'm doing when I'm asleep, can I? You can't get mad at me, I don't even know I'm doing it. Oh, maybe you need to be less sensitive. Just try harder, drink a Horlicks or something. Oh, someone's just been told their priceless family heirloom's worth about 50p. Yeah, this is a bit more stimulating than I thought. The thing is, what if he's right? I can't sleep next to people. I've never been able to do it. So yeah, maybe something is wrong with me. Maybe I am the problem. I know I can't sleep because what if I roll over too much? Oh, Toss and turn all night, or kicking, elbowing, 
stealing the blankets? Or what if I have ice cold feet? Or hot sour breath? Or snore? Fart? Weird sex dreams and he's not in them. I think about it so much that I can't sleep. And then I think about it when I'm asleep. Forever lucid dreams of annoying or exhausting or hurting somebody without thinking or knowing. But the other thing is, I don't think he thinks about that even when he's awake. Every full moon, I would wait for the fairy tailor. I'd send him my wishes written on the fog of a wintry window or spoken aloud in sleepy murmurs. And as my eyelids grew heavy, I was almost convinced I'd seen him. His wings iridescent like moonbeams on water. His fingers spindly thin as he rode a common house spider laden with his deliveries. I'd ask for childish things like fashions for my dolls. <laughs> Bridal veils for weddings with plasticky army action figures. And the fairy tailor would deliver. The delicate garments were spun from cobwebs, stitched together with moonbeams. The wedding dresses sometimes were strewn with stardust. And weren't my dolls the most desired creations ever? After all, that's what they were for. To be looked at and to be played with. My father would never let me put these dolls on top of the Christmas tree. Oh, he preferred the literally legless Christmas fairy. Well, she knew her place. She couldn't run away. You must remember that the fairy tailor wasn't real. As my auntie's arthritis worsened with our collective increasing ages, the tailor's visits lessened until one day they stopped completely. She said she wanted things to be magical for me. And she admitted that the dresses were strewn with nothing more than glitter. So I went about my life knowing that the world was a bitter place simply because the adults went so out of the way to make it seem special. And the world didn't spare me. I became the doll. The thing to be looked at and the thing to be played with. How oh, I envied the fairy tailor and his ability to travel through the night. How he could own the darkness and visit the not seen places. Well, I tried. I really did. But we all know that the night and the dark are no place for a woman. And I wanted to walk down the streets and feel the cool November air in my lungs. I wanted to take a flashlight and walk barefoot along the beach. I wanted not to be afraid. So I did what I'd always done. I wrote my wishes on the fog of a wintry window or on the steam of a bathroom mirror. And the fairy tailor delivered. There was no stardust this time. Just razor sharp tailoring. Shoulders stuffed with the malevolence of black holes. Scritch scratch bare branches against a winter sky for stitching. This was my man suit. So I put it on. And I regarded myself in the mirror. I could now go to the top of the tree. 
could go anywhere. I could walk the night streets and feel the darkness like an arm around my shoulder. And I thought to myself how naive I was as a child to think that the fairy tailor could be anything other than female. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for him to come home. He lives here too, you see. He was here before me, though. I'm new. I moved in about a month ago now, I reckon. The leaves just started dropping from those trees and I thought, new season, new me, new flat. So here I am. Oh, I find myself obsessively watching the door. He went out a few hours ago. He didn't say where he was going, but while he's been gone, I've been doing some pretty sexy stuff with silk. And I am looking spicy today. I keep having these really erotic daydreams of him coming home, taking one look at this very risque, silky situation I've got going on, and then just having a full blown stroke from the sight of it all he collapses on the floor paralyzed by my beauty his face has fallen at one side his speech is slurred his body is just severely confused by how hot i am it's thrilling you see he's not like the other men i've come across they either feared me like they had some sort of phobia of my fierce feminine energy or they wanted to hurt me like really hurt me physically hurt me abuse me crush me I know he likes me he does it's obvious we have a connection you see, he sussed out exactly what food I like and he just brings it to me. No warning, no asking me if I'm even hungry, no words at all, really. He just brings it to me. It's like he's silently trying to fatten me up and it's so, so sexy. And he is always staring at the legs. He just stares at them. It's like he's never seen legs this long before. And let's face it, I do have supermodel legs. Kate Moss, eat your fucking heart out, love. Sometimes, when I catch him looking at them, I pretend I haven't noticed and I'll just stop whatever I'm doing and give him my best Beyonce bum wiggle. It's subtle, but it drives him absolutely crazy. Right now, my legs are actually really hairy, though. <laughs> but hey, I'm owning it. Come on, it's November. We all know it's the hairiest time of year. Am I right, ladies? October rolls in. The long sleeves and the tights come out and we're all just rocking around like the hairy bunch of bitches we really are. <sighs> I hear his footsteps outside. Then the jingling of keys. I panic. I scurry into the nearest room. The door to it is left slightly open and through this crack I can see the whole living room. Fuck! He's not alone. He's he's with someone. A woman! Ugh, she's blonde too. Huge teeth. Absolutely ludicrous smile. Oh, well, this is just embarrassing. He's taking off her coat. What is this bitch wearing? It's like a piece of black mesh for a dress and you can just completely see her bra through it. Slut. Absolutely caked in makeup too, isn't she? Ugh. What is this? How could he do this to me? I really, I really thought we had something special, you know. I would love, I would love to just fuck this up for him right now. Like, really fuck this up for him. I could freak them out so much that she just immediately wants to leave. I could do something like jump out from behind this door with a copy of the Bible. No, 
with a copy of the Watchtower, that's more extreme, and say, excuse me, dear, do you have a moment to talk about our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ? Ugh, but I won't. I, I couldn't even if I wanted to. That's the stupid thing about it. Ugh, they're kissing now. She looks like a real sloppy mess of a kisser too, like a camel. She's just spitting directly into his mouth. It's disgusting. Surely he's not enjoying that. Looks awkward as fuck to me. Oh, I can't watch. Oh, I feel sick. I can't stand to look at this for one more second. I keep watching. Oh, what? Stop judging me. You'd be up here doing the exact same thing and you know it. It's not like I'm up here touching myself. Yet. I'm joking, Jesus. Oh, they're really going at it now. He's got his bloody fingers stuck in her greasy hair. Looks like he's hurting her. Her eyes are even watering there a bit. Good. I hope he is hurting her. Oh, she's laughing about it. What a bloody creep. He don't look amused, though. He's moving his hand down her face. She stopped laughing. He's touching her neck now. Literally working his way from the top down. Why do men do that? They think they need to do all this head, shoulders, knees and toes business first. Just give her boob a couple of unks and then head straight for her knickers. He's still on her bloody neck. Well... A throw, actually. Oh. Oh, my God. I, di- I didn't know he had this in him. Oh, my... I don't know what to say. His hands haven't left her throat. He's gripping it. He's choking it. She's trying to fight him off, but bless her, he's too strong, scratching his face, but it's, it's no good. Oh, don't look at me like that. I'm not going out there. And have him realise I was watching this whole time. That'd be really awkward. Are you mad? Oh, I can see colour draining from her now. Oh, she's still trying to fight him off. Bless her, it's just... Oh, she's lifeless. Oh, she's absolutely lifeless. Oh, it's her own fault though, isn't it? Coming back to man's flat dressed like a slut... I don't blame him at all. Are we standing over her body deciding what to do with her? I wonder if he'll eat her. What? I'd eat her. Otherwise, what was the point of even killing her? It's just a waste then, isn't it? Oh, all this talk of food. I'm getting hungry now, actually. I wonder if he'll get around to feeding me tonight. It kind of seems like he's got his hands full at the moment, doesn't it? I'll leave him to it. There was a blue bottle buzzing round here earlier. I'll call back to my web now and see if I've caught him. I made a new web this morning, did I tell you? It's stunning. I did tell you about my new silky situation, didn't I? Honestly, what am I like? I'd lose one of my eight legs if they weren't screwed on. How is it that one second everything in the world can be neon lights and waves of ecstasy? And then suddenly all of that's ripped out from under you and you fall flat on your face. (sighs) Ow, shit. Sorry, that stinks. I just don't get it. I don't get it at all. One minute everything was fine and, and then the next we're planets apart. He brought me to his place. We were just going there after school to hang out. Don't look at me like that. We were just talking about college. And then we were staring at each other. And then my shirt flew off, but I did try to cover myself because you know what I like about my honeypots. But he didn't laugh at me like he normally does when I get all in my head about this kind of stuff. The stuff I hate about myself. He just stared me square in the face and gently moved my hands away. He waited and whispered, you're perfect. Perfect? Me? 
I mean, my mama hasn't even told me that before. I couldn't breathe. Next thing you know, clothes were flying everywhere. I couldn't get the button off my pants because my hands were shaking so much because, like, the fuck was I even doing? He unzipped them for me, but then he tripped and fell when I was helping him take his pants off. <laughs> we had to laugh because all the cool points were out the window. And then when I wouldn't stop laughing, he pulled me to the ground. And I was laughing and he was laughing and we were just laughing. And when that died down, we just stared at each other. I was butt-ass naked, in his room, on the floor, in the dark. Everything seemed to be moving in slow motion. I could feel his eyes tracing the lines of my body. My heart was pounding so fast, I shuddered from the rhythm of it. But I did try to angle myself away, because, like, once again, what the fuck was I even doing? Then I heard him from behind me in my ear, breathing. Inhale, exhale, stop. Ear, neck, nape, back, ripple. Stop, don't stop. There was this movement. It was getting bigger and bigger with each passing second, and then bam. The door swung open. All this light and yelling. Alonso told me to get out. I, I heard voices. Anger. Everything. Everywhere. I scrambled to get my clothes, yelling and screaming. And then shit started slamming and crashing and breaking. And this pressure from somewhere came barreling down on me. Someone had socked me in the jaw. It felt like my mouth was on fire. It was watering. I, I didn't know where anything was. It was like everything in my brain was screaming at me in punishment, like, get the fuck out of there or you're gonna die. And that same pressure came down on my face, my chest, and then my stomach. Another and another. My adrenaline must have kicked in by then, because out of nowhere, the pain just went away. But someone's fist wasn't nowhere close to being done with me. I felt like I was out of my mind. I had to close my eyes because I couldn't escape all the shit that was rumbling on the inside and outside of my body. Then this big shadow made everything go black. That's when the pummeling stopped. I just heard Alonzo tell me to get the fuck out. So much yelling, it, it was everywhere. I forced my eyes open, started crawling as fast as I could, and grabbed my shit. I don't know how I saw it, but I ran to the light, out the door, down the hall, through the stair, out the entry, and through the door. I skidded and fell to the ground, naked. Scratches and pain, but my brain didn't care. I ran and ran, naked in the dark. Only the streetlights. That's all I had. When I saw headlights, I darted to the side into the trees. I was scared shitless. What if someone was coming for me? I didn't want to die. I ran and ran until I tripped and fell to the ground. Iron hot. Red hot, like the kind of feeling you get in your mouth after a Carolina Reaper, but for my foot. I wanted to run keep going so that no one would find me, but I couldn't. My body was out. So much pain everywhere. I looked through the stuff I'd grabbed. I had my shirt, my shoes, my underwear, and my pants. <laughs> like any of that mattered at that point anyway. I started slipping my stuff on, and at the same time, I started to cry. Cry uncontrollably. I tried to put my left shoe on, but my foot was on fire, and I didn't want to fuck with it. I kept crying.
crying. I threw my shoe down and sat in the dark for days. I was so fucking stupid. What the fuck had just happened? Like, I felt so embarrassed blubbering and wailing in the dark. But I didn't care if anyone heard me. Who cared? But I had to get home before someone checked my bed. So I rummaged for my shoe and limped my ass back here. Snuck in the door, through the breezeway, down the hall and through my door. I made sure to hop on my good leg make sure that my back leg wasn't trailing in dirt or whatever. I closed my door and hobbled over to my bed, making my knee on the frame. I gave way. I sunk into the bed and I started to cry again. I could, all I could do was cry. I couldn't stop. I'm a busted up mess. That's when you crept in, you little corn lug. Sorry, I know I need to suck it out before it's... What if this is it? The end. The end of something that never was... When the sun goes down, Marley will not exist because she didn't exist before. She will not capture the bus home and she will not eat chicken tenders with gravy for dinner. She will not watch Pointless, call the contestants stupid and switch over to the news, which will cover all the people that have died that day. She will not have sex. Think about having sex. Wish the sex would hurry up a bit because you can't have sex when you do not exist. In the damp, armpit of the dark she shimmers past all the windows of people eating chicken tenders with gravy and having sex. The good thing about not existing is you don't have a bedtime. There is a missing poster on a lamppost for a boy aged 14 last spotted by the river on the 9th of October. Have you seen him? She flies above the water and there are a family of gulls sheltering from the wind on a chimney. A mummy gull says, eat your tea. Don't be wasteful. There are gulls starving out there, you know. And baby gull says, but I hate one. Couldn't you have got something better? And mummy gull says, go and sit on the naughty step. And baby gull flops to the edge of the roof and hides. Marley drifts off past them still, into town where people drink froth and fizz and tell each other secrets. The man urinates in the river and the river screams back, you selfish git. And the man stumbles into the spring of the night, ready to punch a stranger about the football score. She flies on all the same, past them all, because she does not exist. She has no appointments to catch. She soars past the town and into the country and there are fields and fields and fields and a lone house on a moor with windows like matchboxes. And there is a girl being read a story about a family looking for a bear. Marley shimmers in the shadow, watching. The parents are acting out the story and the girl is squealing and then it finishes and they kiss her and the lights go off. It is all dark. The trees whisper to each other. Somewhere nearby, a woman is about to give birth. Will it be Marley's time? What number's on the ticket? She buzzes with anticipation, circling the circumference of the bear girl's house. Hours pass and night falls into a pit. Marley lies under a bin lid for want of something to do. As the sun pokes through the cloud like a puppet, the baby is born. Marley tries to look at herself, but she doesn't have limbs to look at. And it doesn't matter either way, because she is still under a bin lid and not in her mother's arms. 
she loosens herself, stretching through the Bear Girl's house to the river and the Gull's chimney and the bus stop. And her time will come. It will, she says. I will eat chicken tenders with gravy and find a bear. I will have sex and sometimes want it to hurry up. I will froth and fizz and tell someone a secret. I will have a secret. And she tumbles through the sky and the trees and thinks about what it would be like to whistle. One day, she thinks, soon. I used to think the moon followed me over. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be in the car, and the trees and the houses would whiz past, but the moon would keep on rolling with us. For a long time it was my secret. The moon wanted me. <laughs> All the other girls fancied David Beckham and Alex Russell in year five, but I was in love with the moon. <laughs> I was going to marry it one day, and we'd have babies who shone and soared through space and sprinkled stardust everywhere. And they'd follow people home to make them feel safe, to make them feel loved. Once we were driving home after going to the cinema, we'd seen Toy Story 2 all together sharing hot sweet popcorn and picnics. And the moon is so bright and round and perfect and I can't wait to go home and dream about us together. Then Reese says, think the moon's following me. And I felt this flip in my stomach. The one I felt on roller coasters. The one I felt when I thought about eternity carrying on without me. My dad shouts, he knows we've stolen his cheese. He slams his foot down and we blast down the road. We are going so fast that the trees and the houses and all the other cars just blur into strips of colour. The moon's disappearing and I feel like I'll never see it again. I am screaming and crying and hearing we shouting, Stop, 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 don't leave him, we're in love, we're gonna have babies and live forever and ever in the sky. <sighs> my mum puts her hand on my dad's arm and flashes him the look. He sighs and the car returns to normal. My mum turns to us and says, the moon's not following you. <laughs> it's just very far away. And objects like trees and houses that we pass by are very close in comparison. That's why it always appears to be in the same place. We nodded and returned to his Game Boy. My mum looked straight ahead. My dad gave me a smile and patted me on the leg. That night I woke up. It was so bright I thought I'd gone to heaven. I open my curtains and the moon is right outside my window. And my dad is floating alongside it, smiling as if this was just a thing he did. He beckoned me to come. So I clambered onto the sill and opened the window crawled through and crept onto the ledge. Mm -hmm. He reaches out his arm, nodded, and I jumped. <sighs> nothingness. Absolute nothingness. And a lifetime later I woke up. My curtains shut. I ripped them open. And the sky was different. <sighs> I wandered downstairs to the kitchen. <laughs> My 
<laughs> Mum and Dad are reading breakfast, reading different newspapers. My dad winks, puts his finger to his lips, makes me tell it to be toast. Normal toast, just cut into circles. <laughs> <laughs> the eyes and smile crafted with jam. When my mum goes upstairs, my dad crouches and whispers, Don't worry, it's just the moon. One day, all of the stars and all of the galaxies and all of the universes are going to smash and collide and explode in the rush to find you. Her shift started at the end of the world and at first the droning, humming, half silence was comforting. Then she started smashing plates just to break the air. Stale cigarette smoke winds its way through her hair though no one has been here for days it seems, maybe just hours. This low-budget road movie set piece has a way of melting down the hours and no matter how many times she mops the same stretch of floor, her eyes are still dirty from yesterday's coffee cup dregs. The 3am waitress in the cafe on the last road to nowhere that time swallowed without permission and belched into oblivion this is the last place you expect to find anyone with any spark left in their veins. And the radio station crackles are the only voices left with names, breathing her in and out of consciousness with every spine firing note. She keeps tripping over half-remembered dreams, as if her legs are made of rain, as if those hazy lies asleep in her ears are the only things holding up the sky. Like there was a brief moment when all was as it should be, and it passed her by. She keeps falling through the gaps in the floor like the wall wants her for its own, like those faded neon lights flicker in time with her half-hearted heart beats, beat, Beat, flicker on and off as the rain taps out sepia dreams of perfect moments that are too clean to be memories but feel like they must have happened somewhere to someone. She's frozen up. She sometimes dives her ivory hands into the freezer just to make her skin so numb it starts to sing. It's comforting, the thawing out, the remembering as limbs break the mind's stubborn ties. Where strangers stayed long enough to notice the colour of her eyes, she falls into the gaps between the fat, fading, gaping seconds and she tries to rise but it's all too broken and beautiful and she dare not look up. In case the sky is falling and the moon's face is like an old man laughing and cars flash by in slow motion to where life is happening but nothing happens here. Just the slow winding down of a heart hungry for rapture. And even if some stranger could dance the joy back into her bones, he would never want to know her name, because this is a place where love comes to die, where moments come to end, where people come to fall apart. She could tell you razor-edged horror stories of the secrets and regrets that she has swept away carelessly with crumpled serviettes. Where hope is doled out in single serving sugar sachets and never lasts long enough for you to stop wanting more. The coffee is black tar that burns your lungs back to life and you can watch yourself grow older in the surfaces of tables that her thin arms glide over with the fragile grace of a swan's neck as if she is dancing. 
Maybe that's why the twilight strangers stumble in to watch her dance. So they can pause the unrelenting wheel spins for the time it takes a song to fade, but never long enough for a connection. There was an old man. Yesterday. An hour ago. A year ago. Who stared into the black sea of his coffee and spoke in hushed tones. He told her, you don't get to my age without being filled with regret. The only choice you get is whether you regret the things you did do or the things you didn't do. He laughed then, as if it was a punchline for a joke he forgot to set up. Something about his laid-back sadness made the air lighter for a time. Sometimes she dares to think it's all a kind of time-lapsed dream. A badly orchestrated joke. That the dust-covered visitors are all actors, all speak in the same inaudible monotone. The phone on the tattered wall never rings because there is nothing left to say. She has mocked all of the words away. All the better to see her split-second footprints on the floor. It's the only way she knows she's not a ghost. That she has weight. As she waits for 3 a.m. to move someplace else. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our November New Moon monologues and our final New Moon monologues of 2020. But before the year is out, the Queens of Cups have one final project that we will be sharing with you. It's called Fishbowl Fest and it is launching at the end of this month. If you want to find out more, you can head to our crowdfunding page, which is at greenlit.fund slash project slash fish hyphen bowl hyphen fest it's also going to be linked in the details you can also catch us in january 2021 as part of the living record festival where myself and grace are contributing a piece as the queens of cups called the vagina duologues and if you want to keep up with us on our social media pages then follow us on at the queens of cups and at new moon monologues for when we will be relaunching new moon monologues next year and our biggest thank you of the night goes out to the writers performers and directors who made tonight possible um, we'd like to invite all of you on to this digital stage and take a group zoom bow <laughs> and happy super new moon to you all